доктор Стивън Голдфарб. От CERN ще ни поговори за тъмната селена. Той работи по експеримента Атлас на CERN, експеримента L3, който цели да определи трите основни елементарни частици които в Вселената. Като през последните години доктор Голдфарб се фокусира върху комуникация на науката в ролята си на Atlas Outreach Education координатор, презентиране на множество тет събития. Доктор Голдфарб. Добро утро. И това е за моят българия, и сега. Това ще бъде в английски. I have a question for you, though. Before I get started, how many of you um, have heard of the Atlas experiment? So there's some, oh, okay, not bad. And how many of you heard of the Large Hadron Collider? More. CERN? Even more. The Higgs boson? Okay, okay, very good, okay. So yeah, the experiments uh, weren't that well known. In fact, when uh, the, the Higgs boson had been introduced uh, into the world, uh, the, the twi I was following Twitter at the time, and it wasn't as loud of a place as it has as become now. But uh, yeah, the, the things that were trending were, were you know, CERN, are not our experiments, the ones that found it, Atlas and CMS, but you know, CERN, the LHC, and, um, and of course, Comic Sans. You know, and I'll show you why in a bit here. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. So my talk, uh, I called it when I, when I was first asked for uh, an abstract, uh, missing pieces, the LHC in our dark universe. But in fact, on, on further reflection, it's actually more like this. It's hidden pieces because the stuff's there. <laughs> the universe is there. We've been in it and enjoying it for some time. But there's some things we just haven't been able to see or to understand at the moment. So I'm going to try to focus a bit on those things, okay? Um, just as a warning, I'd like to warn people about this just because of the climate these days. Um, there's going to be a lot of facts. I'll, I'll probably not lie to you. Uh, if you would like to talk about fictitious things, we can go have a cup of coffee outside uh, later on in between. Uh. So I want to talk to you and go back a little bit in time here. Uh, this was a seminar uh, that was held at CERN. And it's very interesting. This is what a seminar looks like. You can see uh, very excited physicists in here. That's our auditorium. That's the main auditorium of CERN. Uh, at the time, uh, we were preparing for conferences, and what's very typical is that we present our results to each other because we'd like to see if there's agreement or disagreement in the results. And we were just getting ready to head over to a conference in Melbourne, uh, and some presentations were made on a search for a particular particle that had been proposed many years beforehand, about 48 years ahead of time. And, uh, and, and the presentation was made by the, the, two, uh, uh, the two spokespersons. So this is one of the talks here. Uh, we'll go over it all in detail. Oh, no, actually not. Uh, this is a talk by a guy named Joe Incandela from the CMS experiment. What I find the numbers that are most interesting on this, on this plot here are here. This is slide number 106 out of 116. And it's a very typical presentation. It's a talk from physicists to physicists about physics. Uh, the other uh, person, Fabiola Gianotti, was uh, the spokesperson for the experiment. I was working on the Atlas experiment. And um, what's interesting here, this is the culmination of the presentation. And, uh, and the big number here in red is this number 5.0 times a Greek uh, number, sigma, uh, a Greek letter. Uh, and that brought up stupendous uh, applause. People stood up. Uh, there were tears in people's eyes because of this. And, um, and that's an amazing thing. The next uh, day, I took a look around at the newspapers. And uh, you know, you can see here some science newspapers, Al Jazeera, uh, Hindu, all, all around the globe. Um, perhaps most amazingly, Auto World, uh, on the front cover, uh, were showing uh, results from this, this seminar. And that, that's, that's not something that you usually see. It reached everybody. There's a picture that my, my colleague took there while we were having breakfast uh, in, in Melbourne. Uh, of the entire front page of The Guardian there with, with an event display on it. By the end of that week, a billion people had watched video from a seminar that featured hundreds of slides. And I thought about that, and, and um, naturally, I asked, why? You know, wh why were people so interested in this result? So I thought back, and I looked back in, 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 in the history of our, of our archives and records, and I think that the origins of this excitement were back here. It was one of the original um, presentations that was made. 
Uh, this is Og. Uh, she was a, 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 a very well-known professor at the time, making a presentation. This is a session about uh, you know phys particle physics at the time, and she was presenting the results. Uh, of her student Zog. Here you see Zog here. He was actually doing the very, very first uh, particle collision. He's smashing together two rocks. And he determined a very uh, uh, important result uh, that was rocks you know, are made up of um, smaller rocks. And that was the beginning of our field, really. It was, it was groundbreaking work, so to speak, at, at, at the time. Uh, and it was a long time, and ever since then, that's essentially what we're doing. As we're doing the same thing, we're looking, what's inside, what's inside, what are we made of? So we have big questions. They date from way back then. The moment we were able to, to perceive our universe, to look around ourselves, to look at things, we have big, big questions. And these per persist to today. Uh, you know, where do we come from? Uh, what, what are we made of? What are the, what are the components of us? Uh, what's our destiny? Where are we going to? Uh, what are the rules behind all of this? There must be something which, which makes decisions from us going, starting and moving onward. Um, and is there other stuff out there that we don't see? Because we're always finding things that we hadn't seen before. And these help us to answer these other questions. So these questions we have, and I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to answer them all today. Uh, maybe over coffee we can try to come up with the answers. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the process by which we do try to answer these questions. Uh, so we start, I'm going to start with the first really important scientific instrument. Uh, it's, it's this thing. Uh, it's, it's a high precision detector with a very sophisticated software system and, and hardware system, which allows us to make really, really amazing measurements. We use this device for, for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. It depends when you define the beginning of us. Uh, animals uh, have used this device, and it works extraordinarily well. Here uh, you can see the precision. This is actually um, my friend Eva, and, and th for the very first time I can present this to a Bulgarian audience. She's Bulgarian, Eva. She's from Sofia, and, uh, and as of course all you know, really beautiful women do come from Sofia. Uh, she has really, really lovely hair, lovely blonde hair, very fine hair, and uh, the human eye can perceive, it can, it can differentiate, it has a resolution of tens of microns. It's an amazing, amazing resolution that you can see. So she was close to me, I took that image, and you can see there, you can differentiate the different strands of hair. That's pretty, pretty good resolution. If you look out, so that's looking close, if you look out, you can, um, you can actually see something which is two and a half million light years away, and this is uh, Andromeda. That's a galaxy It's out there. You might think, okay, fine, there's a galaxy out there two and a half million light years away. It's actually going to hit us. Did you guys know that? I just I learned about this. It's actually going to go through Milky Way, uh, but it's not going to be next week or anything. I think it's, <laughs> it's a long time from now. But, but we're actually on a, on a collision course. And amazingly, actually, the prediction is that the stars are not going to ever hit each other. They're so well. I, I, I digress. It's going to be interesting times, and maybe our great grandchildren will get to see that. Um, so, is this good enough? This device that we have. Are we happy with that? We can see a lot of things. We can see precision measurements. We can learn a whole lot. We saw apples falling down. We, we drew conclusions. Uh, you know, no, of course not. We're human beings. We still have fundamental questions. We're never happy. We want to know what else there is. So how do we do that? How do we find out what else there is? Well, uh, I got this question. This is, this is my friend Dave. Uh, he, he's uh, my mortal enemy because he works on the other experiment, CMS, but he's also a very good friend. He lives right next door to me. And uh, we do uh, a lot of outreach together. In fact, we've both now been chair of the International Particle Physics Outreach Group. We share that together, and we also share our love for, for explaining uh, the science that we do. So I had him join me. This is a, a, a virtual visit. Uh, we do these now to schools all around the globe we have classrooms come and talk to us and ask their questions to us. This happens to be a classroom uh, that's in Alaska. So you can actually see that it's dark there and it's dark on our side too. It was evening on our side and I think it's always dark in Alaska as far, <laughs> far as I could tell. The classroom was there and uh, they always ask great questions and I've always found out that the younger the students are, the more profound the questions are. So this young boy in the front here wearing the Netflix and chill t-shirt, I don't know if you... <laughs> 
You guys know what that means. I don't think he knew what it meant. I don't think his mom knew what it meant when she let him out the door. Um, so, so he just came out. He just, you know, they raise their hands and they ask questions, simple questions like this. How do we measure what we can't see? And ever since he's asked me that question, um, I've been trying to answer it, and I've been wondering about it. What is the answer to that? And so I'm going to try uh, to address that question a bit here. Um, and that's, that's essentially science. He wrapped up all of science right there. Uh, but let's, let's go through this and how, how we've been proceeding through time. So I, in, in my own simple mind, think that there's essentially two ways, and, and this has come out in physics, uh, especially particle physics, the physics that I do. Uh, it's manifest itself uh, in, the, in the names of the, of the people, the, the roles that we play. So we have something called exploration, and those are us, what we call us, ourselves experimentalists. We do experiments, we measure, we look at things, we measure uh, their properties, we count them. This is the, the exploration happening. You see that you have microscopes, you use, tele you use devices to look out, to look in, and to explore, to go around uh, the, the, the planet or to go outside of the planet. You try to explore, to see things that you haven't seen before. Uh, but you also have these guys uh, who are our best friends called theorists probably the most optimistic of the scientists. These, these guys are great. So they, they look at the stuff that we've measured and they think about it and its impl implications. So one good example that I have in here, this guy, Eratosthenes. So he, 600 years BC, I think is approximately the time, he was doing trade down in Alexandria and he was going up and down uh, the Nile. And when he was down the Nile, uh, some people there told him, oh, you know what, this one time of the year, when it's spring, uh, if you look down this well, you see the, the at, at noon, you'll, you'll see the sun exactly down there at the bottom of the well, and you can see it in the water. And he said, he got an idea. Oh, I know, we can measure something. Now, at this time, human beings had already figured out, it was old news, that the earth was round. Okay? I don't know why we go through this over and over again, I don't know. There are rap stars out there who still think it's flat. There's, there's other people out there. I don't know why we go through that, but um, you know, we had already figured out. You, you just have to look at like a lunar eclipse. You, you can see that there's the curvature there wherever you are. You could, there's people who traveled, uh, you know, and, the, and they saw the stars change. They figured, out, oh yeah, it's round. Uh, so that was old news. But he measured. So he had his friend. He got his cell phone out and he called his friend who was up in Alexandria, or however they communicated back then. Um, and he had him do a measurement at precisely at noon, and, and they measured basically the shadow that was, that was cast, and they were able to use triangulation and figure out uh, the circumference of the planet. Not just that it's round, but the circumference of the planet to within a few percent. It depends, the measuring units they had back then, we don't know exactly how precise they, that unit was, but it probably it was within a few percent they knew the distance. Now, if the experimentalist down in, the, in the, the lower part, there's no laser on this, but that's okay. In the, in the lower left, uh, this guy, that's just an image of this guy, Columbus. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he, he, he went from Europe and he was trying to find a route to go to Asia. If he'd actually looked in the textbooks from 2,000 years beforehand, he would have brought more provisions with him. Uh, and he got lucky. Okay, I don't want to, you know, put down all that hard work it is to sail across an ocean and all, but he got pretty lucky that there happened to be this, this continent uh, in between. And so, uh, you know, it, it wasn't him who found that the Earth was round. We, we, we sort of knew it. But stuff happened in the middle. There were dark ages and there was confusion and things like this, and I think we're going through that now a little bit. But, um, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so it would have been good for him to pay attention. And so we do pay attention to our theorists now. They give us ideas what to look for. So let me go a little bit more into this. What we're doing, so I'm gonna focus on the ex sort of experimental side now, because that's what I like, that's what I do. Um, we've, we've gone through, I'm gonna go through all of history very, very quickly in just a few slides. Um, you know, we've built these nice instruments to help us to look out, to see what's out there in the expanse. And you can see here this guy named Galileo, he, he came up with this nice thing, this, this telescope that allowed him to look out there and see, oh, Jupiter's not just this dot out there, but it's actually a, a, a planet and it's got moons uh, going around it. So you had this nice image that we were able to see from back then. Uh, a few years later, uh, we were able to launch uh, satellites. We'll learn more about satellites, I think, uh, later, later on. 
Um, there's a lot of beautiful satellites out there. This is the Hubble. And uh, the Hubble was able to give us extremely uh, clear images after we put some contact lenses on it. It uh, gave us some uh, extremely clear images uh, from all around out in space and showed us galaxies and we saw the stars in them and we still are getting uh, amazing images uh, from the Hubble and from other telescopes that we put out there. Not just looking at light that's visible light but also uh, the other parts of the, the spectrum and we have radio telescopes we, we can look using using photons we can do an amazing amount but we also found um, uh, that we can do other things and this is this is very very recent I don't know if you've heard about the Nobel Prize in Physics this past year, but it was given to uh, three people who came up with this idea. That is that we can listen uh, to the universe. These devices here uh, use lasers. So this is something called LIGO. There's, there's a couple LIGO experiments uh, in the US. There's also Virgo in Italy, and there's some other devices being built around uh, the world in, in Japan. There's at least, an, at least one other besides that. These devices, uh, they shoot light, laser light down these, these two orthogonal 90 degree arms. And, and because of the mirrors, it should be that the light cancels itself and you see nothing. Okay, they're, they're, they're tuned just like that to a precision that's it's impossible to imagine. It's something like if you take the, the, the size of an atom and divide it by the distance between the sun and the earth. Okay, <laughs> it's very amazing precision. They're able to see if something changes in the size of these arms. And they did hear that. It's, a, it's like hearing, because it's vibrations, right? What they were looking for was something predicted by Einstein 100 years earlier, was that uh, if there is some big magnetic phenomena that happened out in space, it would ripple space-time. And you'd be able to notice that you know, space-time changed by a tiny amount. And they were able to hear it. They were able to, the first things that they heard were these two black holes that had come together several billion years beforehand. And since then, we've also uh, heard the, the collisions of neutron stars was, was recently. That, that's where our, our gold rings come from, actually. I don't know if you knew that. I just learned that. It's great. Gold, heavier element, metal elements like this come from those collisions. And we are made of stars. That's a cool, that's, a, that's another diversion. Anyway. Uh, they made this measure. So we're actually able to listen out in, into space and to learn things about what happens in our universe. Uh, we also like to look in, inside ourselves, inside material. What are, you know, what are we made out of? That's, that's the stuff that I'm working on myself. Uh, we used uh, microscopes. Here you can see Eva's beautiful hair there magnified using a light microscope. We also learned that light's not the only way that you can figure things out. You can use um, uh, electrons as well. So you can actually use particles in Bombard because particles have waves associated with them. You guys all know quantum field theory, so I don't have to explain that. But um, electrons can give you images that are extraordinary, extraordinarily clear. And depending on their energy, you see different different aspects of things. And, and we've used other particles to, to, to probe. You know, particles have waves associated with them. So the higher energy you go to, the smaller the wavelength and the smaller the dimensions that you can probe. This is why we're always excited about going to higher energies. And so uh, this is one of the devices we use. Uh, and this is another device used. This is a device that, that I've been using for many years now. This is the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it was put into place uh, in 2008, was when we finally were able to start turning it on and start looking at things. And, and what you can see is, so basically the way that works is you have parts along this enormous collider, I'll go into a little more detail later, where the particles pass through each other, protons pass through each other, and they can collide, they can interact with each other. Much like Zog was smashing rocks, we're sort of putting these things through each other and watching their interactions. And you get images like this one uh, over here uh, that comes from uh, the Atlas experiment, that's the experiment I work on. So it's sort of an image from a proton's point of view when its best friend explodes in front of him. Um, that's what happens in, in the collisions. So, so we've been able to probe to very, very, very small dimensions. So, so we've learned a lot. What, what have we learned from these things? Well, as far as looking out goes, uh, we've learned that we're on this beautiful blue dot uh, that's one of many blue, many dots, let's say, many, many planets that circle around uh, a sun as opposed to the opposite. It seems that we're all moving around the sun. And uh, that sun is one of 100 billion suns uh, in a galaxy. There's 100 billion stars out there in our galaxy. 
and there's roughly 10 to 100 billion of these galaxies out there in the universe. There's a lot of stuff out there. We're just one small blue speck uh, in this universe. So that changes your perspective, <laughs> really, a lot when you realize that. And so it's beyond not just the science, the knowledge, but also the perspective of humans that got changed by these devices. We also learned a bit about time, because by looking at the motion of what's out there in the universe, you can see that you can look back in time. The light that comes to us from far, far away took time to get to us. And so we know what was happening. We can, we can sort of measure the history uh, of our universe. And what we know roughly is that we're about 13.8 billion years old. Seems, I feel that way sometimes. Um, and and uh, you know, we are in this, this universe that, that seems to be expanding at a, a more rapid rate. And I'll go into that in a little more detail too. So when looking in, instead of looking out, with our microscope devices, we learned that Eva's beautiful hair actually contains cells. There's things inside there, and those cells are made up of material. The material is made up of molecules. This is actually a molecule uh, of, of what makes up hair. Uh, and then inside these molecules, uh, there are atoms. And when we looked inside atoms, we find that the, the protons at the very center are actually made up of things called quarks. This is where we're at now. Seems like Russian dolls, right? Um, and so we continue to ask that question, you know, what's, what's inside there? Right now, we seem to have a model that works very, very well. And it works so well, because it's, it's been working since the late 1960s, that we've taken to calling it the standard model. It just keeps working. It makes predictions. All we care about from these theorists, by the way, they can do whatever they want, <laughs> but they have to give us predictions. And they do give us predictions, and we try to measure them. If their measurements don't match their predictions, then we throw out the model. That's actually how truth sort of works, but I, people are forgetting that these days. You measure things first, and if you see things, for example, ice caps that are melting, you don't say, that doesn't match with my theory, I'm gonna forget that. Uh, you change your theory. And um, so that's how we're progressing in science. Maybe that's the old-fashioned way, but that's how we're progressing. We found out you know, that we have these quarks. Uh, this is sort of a map of the particles uh, that we know of. Uh, they seem to be it, as far as we can tell. You have quarks. You see they're in blue, up quark, down quark, charm, strangeness. We love these names, top, bottom. Uh, and we also have leptons, electrons you know about going around the atoms. Electrons turn out they have a, a more heavier sister named muons and an even more heavier sister named tau particles. They're more massive. It's kind of interesting. There was, we didn't know we had all these things, and we don't really need them, frankly. Uh, to build us, we need the up quark, the down quark, and electrons. But it turns out these other things exist. They just exist for a very short time. If you're more massive, you decay. I found that out myself, actually. Um, but <laughs> if you're more massive, you decay, you can decay to lighter things. The more massive you are, the quicker you decay. Uh, and, but the things that are, that are stable, us, we're made of just the lightest things. We don't decay anymore. There's nothing for us to decay into. Okay. But we've also found out that Mother Nature can produce these more massive particles through particle collisions. So adding energy, you can make E become mc squared. Mm -hmm. And you can produce these particles and study them. So that's, that's the whole game. That's what we do. We learned about this not be by making the collisions ourselves, but Mother Nature is colliding particles in our upper atmosphere uh, all the time. And uh, those collisions produce new particles and those particles we measure. By the way, my timer is stopped, so you have to throw something at me when my time's up, because otherwise I'll talk forever. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's where we're at now. But we had some questions about that. In that table, you had these different things. They have different masses. And of course, we don't stop asking these questions like, why? What's the point of that? Why, why mass? Uh, where does it come from? Why do these things have different masses? And they're not even predictable, the masses. There's really no rhyme or reason to the masses that we see. Why do particles, we, we, sort of, you know, we don't understand the other things either. They're just properties, charge, uh, spin, there's these different aspects of particles that we see. They have these intrinsic properties, and we ask those questions as well. But a more intriguing one to us at the time was this mass, because we didn't understand it. We didn't understand our theoretical model. It was around 1964 we asked this question. What's giving something which has no volume, a point 
particle, we call it, something with just no structure to it at all. Why on earth does it even have a mass, and what gives it the mass? This very bright guy, uh, his name is uh, Peter Higgs. Uh, he tried to answer that, and you can see the answer there. It's pretty clear. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, but it, it's actually, it, may, it fits on a t-shirt. I have another t-shirt like that, but I decided to wear this one today. But it fits on a t-shirt, it fits on a coffee cup. Uh, and this, this came about in the late 1960s. Uh, it was all put together. They were, he was working on the problem for the carriers of force. So we have carriers of the different nuclear forces. It seemed that they would have to have a mass, and yet the theory didn't work. It, it didn't allow that. And so they had to come up with a new theory that would allow it. Uh, he came up with something. Basically, the concept is this, there, there's, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but um, a, a perfect symmetry was broken early in time, just after the Big Bang. And uh, the mo you can make a model that works for that. Uh, essentially, what it, its implications are that there's a field absolutely everywhere all around us, uh, which uh, that field, when, when particles go through it, they interact with it, and it gives them mass. And of course, you can also turn that around and say the more massive, the more they interact with that field. But that's the way it works. This is the theory that they came up with. And uh, they told us, they said, you know, this is it's really nice. We said, that's great. So how do we measure this? You know, if, if there is a field, by the way, his paper was one page of A4 paper to propose this. It's so cool. And it was rejected by CERN. The referee said, this is too short. <laughs> and and um, they told him, you know, if there's a field, then of course there's a particle that, that propagates that field. That's just quantum field theory. Again, I don't have to remind you about quantum field theory, but uh, there's, whenever there's a field, there's a particle. When there's a particle, there's a field. And so he said, okay, yeah, everybody knows that, so I'll write it down. So he wrote it down. He said it would be, it'd be called a boson. It's a, it's a certain kind of boson. And uh, he put it in there. And, uh, but he said, you guys forget about trying to find it. You're never going to find it. It's, first of all, there's no way to predict what its mass is. Secondly, it interacts so weakly uh, with all the other particles that it would take, you know, gazillions, well, actually trillions of collisions for you to, to actually see one, depending on where you're looking, too. I mean, it, it's, it's just impossible. Forget it. So, of course, we put that up in the locker room. <laughs> you're never going to find it. And that was our goal. You know, from then on, we were, you know, we got to find that thing. And so, uh, so we built this thing. So, actually, you know, we built predecessors, other accelerators beforehand, and uh, at least for my career, we were always looking for it, uh, and it didn't show up. And again, they couldn't tell us where. But by the time around uh, the late 1990s came about, we'd eliminated a lot of regions. We could say it's not here, and it's not up here from cosmological data, I think the studies up here. They, they, we, it sort of got scrunched into a certain area, and it helped us to justify, it was very important, it helped us to justify the construction of such an enormous uh, accelerator. Uh, as, a, as a Large Hadron Collider and the experiments that went around it. So we built this thing, and the idea is it's going to go to cover that energy range and possibly, in the collisions, produce this Higgs boson, which, as you now know, will decay instantly, but it decays to other things. And they could tell us if it's here, it's going to decay to these things. If it's here, it's going to decay to these things. And so we just made a lot of searches, and, and, and we looked. We built this device. So this is, this is the entire accelerator. Uh, Atlas uh, is, is my favorite. There's, there's several um, uh, detectors. Atlas and CMS are the two really general purpose, like the largest lenses, most powerful lenses on a microscope. And they're opposite each other. Uh, we love each other. We need each other because we need for uh, each experiment to exist in order to, to verify results uh, and to compete. The competition is quite useful to have. Uh, we both you know, try to get the best results that we can. Um, and usually what happens is we compete for a while, we present our results, and then, if it's possible, we try to combine them to give the world the best possible measurement. But you really, for science, you have to have at least two, right? Um, the other experiments are other beautiful experiments. LHCB tries to answer the question of why do we exist? And I just saw this in the news a lot these days, because one of my colleagues made this great statement, we shouldn't exist. And of course, everybody loves that. But, but it, is a, it is a big question. So if, if you watch this, we're going to do an experiment here. Will, will you shake my hand? You should watch carefully. OK, did anybody notice anything special? We didn't explode. <laughs> and and that's, that's something which, which uh, you know, we don't understand. Because we don't know why, we really don't know why we exist. There was a perfect balance uh, in the collision in, in, in the, the beginning of the universe, at the Big Bang, a balance of what we call matter and antimatter. We see that in all of our formula and, and in all the collisions, everything that we measure, there's a balance. 
And, and it's true that at the Big Bang, equal amounts of matter and antimatter were produced, and they all ran into each other and annihilated. And that did happen. Everything disappeared except a little bit of dust. And we're that dust, basically. And we're matter. And we do not see that there's any chunks of antimatter, any anti-galaxies anywhere. So it's a big question. LHCb focuses on trying to answer that by looking at a specific sector of the physics. Alice, uh, another nice experiment. I point this way, I should point this way. Here. Uh, Alice, uh, they look at collisions of heavy ions. So sometimes we take lead ions, or just recently we took xenon ions and collide them together instead of protons. And that creates a different kind of environment, but it helps us to look at what the universe was like uh, before uh, protons came into existence. That's a very interesting time. Uh, I, I wasn't around then, but it's, 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 uh, you know, it's sort of quarks and gluons are there in this big sort of uh, soup, primordial soup, and, and it's very important. It's, 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 a, it's a theory that we can write down on our t-shirts, but you need measurements, really. Uh, it's very hard to do calculations. You need measurements of that to understand that a little better. So these are what the four experiments are doing. Uh, here's what they look like. They're big, beautiful devices. Uh, they are big, okay, so this experiment that, that I work on, Atlas, which is down uh, over there, uh, is the largest in volume. It's a half of a football pitch in length, about a quarter of a football pitch in, in height, uh, so 46 meters by 26 meters. It's um, packed full of electronics and sensitive detectors. There's 100 million, more than 100 million channels of information that come out of that. These devices, and, and, and the same is essentially true for CMS. CMS is more compact, but it's, it's more massive. It actually uh, weighs twice as much as, as Atlas because we choose different technology. They're completely independent. Um, they, the, the amazing things that are there are essentially three-dimensional cameras that are taking pictures at a rate of about 40 million per second. So that's what these devices have to do. They take high-resolution images at 40 million in collisions per second, they're measured, and, uh, and then they give us the data. So these experiments are trying to answer the big questions. Uh, concerning the Higgs boson, we were, we were told to look in certain areas. We did look in those certain areas, and over time, in the first several years that we had data, so around 2000, we collected data really 2010, a lot more in 2011 and 2012. We started to see images that looked like what was predicted. Uh, you can see here uh, collisions in Atlas and in CMS. And that led to um, our presentation of these results, which was the very first indications uh, that we saw uh, the Higgs boson. So these might not look so thrilling to you, but they are to us. <laughs> this is, and, and, and the, these, these um, Plots have increased in size. We can measure very precisely. Uh, the game that we play here is we take a look at combinations of particles, and based on their energy and their angle, we reconstruct what the mass would be of a particle that decayed to them. And most of the time, we're wrong, and there's nothing there, and that's like this nice, smooth line. That means there was nothing there. But when you see a bump, that's statistically significant on there. And by statistically significant, there's like a, at that point, there was like a one in 10 million chance that that was just an anomaly. It was pretty sure. Scientists were very skeptical. It takes five sigma. Five sigma is a lot. Okay, it's a really significant signal before we jump up and down and say, yeah, we got something. And so that's what we, that's the point that we were at during the seminar in, in 2012. We've, we've produced a lot of these since then. This allowed us to, um, be confident in our coffee cups. We'd actually made the coffee cups many years beforehand. We really had believed that this particle existed because we were able to make predictions with it, but we just had never really seen it. And we were able to give it a mass and stick it onto this table, and we were very, very happy. Uh, so that's sort of the story of how you, you can, over time, you know, look, build devices that allow you to see more and find things that were predicted. Now, what, what are we still missing? <laughs> A lot. There's a lot of things out there that we don't understand. Um, we're still trying to answer this main question here. Where, uh, where do we come from and where are we going? Okay, what are our origins? We've made this map. We understand pretty well our age of our universe. This is done by looking at the shifts in the light of galaxies and clusters and how they move away from each other. So we found out uh, by looking back at radiation that came from a certain point of time that there was a time where the universe expanded very rapidly 
and then it's expanded slightly, but now we're at this point where we see that, that it's not just expanding, but it's, it's accelerating the expansion of the universe, and that's a really big question. Why? Uh, why do we exist? I already mentioned this question. We can shake hands and not explode. That's a very good thing, I suppose, but it really makes us wonder. Matter and antimatter. Uh, what are we made of? The question of Russian dolls, d you know, are quarks really it? It's natural for everyone to be skeptical. Many times in history, we said, okay, that's it, atoms, that's it, nothing more, uh, and it's not the case. So we still try to explore this. We look for the possibility that quarks are made up of other, other things. We do not see that. You would see that with excitations of, of quarks, uh, like orbitals in, in, in an atom, and we don't see that. But we're still looking. Um, why is gravity so weak? And it's really weak. I know that sometimes, like in the morning when you're trying to get out of bed, it feels very, very strong. Um, but, you know, if I, take, if I took two electrons and I tried to bring them together here, uh, you know that they have the same charge. They'll push each other apart. This electromagnetic force pushes them apart. But they also have a mass. And so, like planets, they should be pulled towards each other. The difference in strength of those forces is a million, 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 million times. It's unfathomable, the difference. We have theories that can sort of explain why there's slight differences, slight difference meaning order of 1,000 or 10,000, between the strengths of electromagnetism and the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force, but we do not have gravity, and it's not on our coffee cup. We, <laughs> we're not happy till everything's on the coffee cup. We don't know what to do with gravity. There's uh, proposals. It's been proposed that, ah, this is a very simple solution. We're simple electromagnetic beings, and we're living on this simple three-dimensional manifold, but there's another dimension out there. And gravity knows about that dimension, and so it's hanging out there in these other dimensions, and we only see a little bit of it. And that's a really nice theory, and we are looking for that. This is what came up with this whole thing about black holes, by the way, because the phenomena that we'd look for is called a micro black hole. You would see a bunch of tracks coming out from a collision, and that would tell you that you're getting a glimpse of this extra uh, dimension. So we do really want to find black holes. We cannot produce a black hole that engulfs the Earth and makes us all disappear. I shouldn't say that because we'd like to tell the funding providers that we can do that, all right? Yeah. But, uh, we can't. We can't. We can never create something more than what we've got. And energy is like that. It's, just, it's conserved. Um, and then there's this question here. And this question that I want to address a little bit more here in, in a little bit more detail. What's holding this together? This brilliant astronomer, Vera Rubin, unfortunately, she just left us uh, December of last year. Uh, but she was brilliant. Uh, she, you know, we had seen the, the motion of galaxies, we actually, her predecessor, Zwicky, had, had looked at the, the, the motion of galaxies. He said, there's, there's something's not quite right, something's not adding up. The hypothesis is simple. You know, if you look at uh, a solar system and you look how the planets move around it, you've probably seen models of this, maybe animations, you notice that Mercury moves pretty fast relative to old Pluto or Neptune out there at the very far end. And that you can calculate as Newtonian macroscopic uh, gravity. Okay, if gravity is the force, you can calculate how fast they should move relative to each other. She managed to get a hold of a, of a nice telescope. She could take a look and measure the motion of the stars in the galaxy, and she, found, she was sure she was going to find out the exact same thing in a galaxy as what we'd known from the solar systems. Uh, it turned out, no. <laughs> Nature's not like that. It turns out that the stars on the outside are moving quite fast relative to what you'd expect. She said, and she made this nice leap, okay, she said, well, you could explain this motion, but only if there's stuff in there that we're not seeing. And so he said, oh, okay, so it's just a correction. There's some stuff we don't see yet, so just add that little bit to it. Well, it turns out to be 85%. So 85% of galaxies, and it turns out of essentially of the universe, is stuff we don't see for the stuff part, the matter part, okay? And so uh, that's a big question. What is it? And we think we might have a chance of figuring that out. So let me summarize. Um, and beer is always a good way to summarize, I think, even in the morning. Uh, so the major stuff out there, energy and matter are the same for a physicist. It's the same stuff. It's just different manifestations of it. Something is making our universe accelerate in its expansion. 
That's energy, and we can't account for that. We have no idea what that is. In fact, it turns out that's the vast majority of our universe, is that energy. And probably, well, there's some people who think at the LHC we could find a solution to this, that even the Higgs boson can give us a hint for that. Um, but I don't understand that, so I'm not going to talk about it here. <laughs> um, but, but there are possibilities there. But that's the vast majority, there's this thing called dark energy. And um, another part of it, a very large part, is this dark matter. So this is matter form uh, and that's, that's inside the galaxies and, and, and stuff. We also see lensing of stars. We have a lot of evidence that indicates there's this dark matter exists. It's really invisible matter, okay? You just, you just can't see that. And then that little bit of foam at the top, uh, most of it's interstellar gas, and a tiny bit is us. A tiny, tiny bit of, of the universe is us. These numbers have changed a little bit over time, but they're relatively, the proportions are relatively similar. So let me explain how we can try to solve this. So this bit, I give up on for now. I'm not smart enough to figure that out. There are some people thinking about that, some theorists who think they can figure that out. Um, but that's the expansion of, of, of the universe. Then there's this part from Vera Rubin who says there's this good portion of matter is this dark matter. But here's what can help us out here. So we had this question of what's giving all of matter, the matter you can see and the matter you can't see, a mass, and we did figure that out. This thanks to this guy and, and the others working on it. It's a success there. We do understand the mechanism. And that's very interesting because that gives us a tool. If we have a particle that interacts, okay, for us to, to for things to get mass, they have to interact with the Higgs boson. If we have something that gives mass, then it, it can interact with the dark matter as well. So if we can measure that particle in precision, its properties, uh, we have a grasp at being able to find dark matter. And it would look something kind of like this. This is a collision, and this dashed line, it may be a little hard to see, but there's a dashed line that goes out of it. Um, dashed line is where there was an imbalance of energy. You know, from conservation of momentum, if you have a collision like this, you should be able to add up the momentum vectors of everything and come up to zero when there's a collision like that. It should all balance. So there was no momentum going sideways when they went like this, when they hit. And so when there's a lot of imbalance there, that's a signature that something went out that we didn't see. So we can look for things, we can measure things that we can't see. I'm still trying to answer that question for that kid. I'm going to get back to him. He'll be old and working on the experiment next time I see him. So now I want to get back just to, to sort of sum things up here. This is an image I really, really like. I just saw it recently. I heard a very nice a podcast in a show called Radio Lab. I'm a big fan of podcasts. And, uh, and they were talking to the widow of Carl Sagan. When the, um, I don't know if you guys remember these. When I was a kid, these, we launched the Voyager spacecraft. And these spacecraft went out into space. And they uh, were designed to examine our solar system. Uh, she was describing a, a gold album that they actually put in, and they put on one of these in case it ever gets found by other life out there. And so they can hear what Ozzy Osbourne sounds like or something, I don't know. Uh, so, so they put this out, and it has lots of very interesting things to work. The, the, the making of that album is an amazing story. But as it was going way out there, you know, it, it, the amount of energy it could get was, was diminishing. And so they finally said, okay, it's gotten past Neptune, we're going to stop taking pictures now. And Carl Sagan, who's a great scientist, great astronomer at the time, who was very popular with the public, he would explain things. He said, no, no, I want you to do one more image. I want you to turn it around and take a picture of us. So they turned around, they took a picture, and this is that picture, that one blue speck there, right there. And his point was to say, you know, how insignificant we are. We're just at this tiny dot there, in this whole huge universe, we're nothing. Why do we even bother? Well. If I look at this, this paper here, this is the paper uh, that described the, the, the discovery of the Higgs boson. It's not the paper that's so thrilling to me. It's these pages here. I mentioned that, that um, well, you can't really read it, but okay, so yeah, my resolution changed there. Okay, it doesn't matter. This is the names of the authors, okay? Um, 3,000 people, okay, Remember, keep in mind that the theory paper had one page. <laughs> we have about 15 pages here. <laughs> 3,000 people from all around the globe came together, driven by this, these basic questions, what are we made out of? 
What is it? What are the fundamental building blocks of our universe? They came together regardless of where they're from. What's not important is the names. It's a shame you won't see this, but the, the, these, sli these slides here towards the end, there's a lot of names, right? This is actually the, the institutions. 108, more than 180 institutions from, from 38 countries, but actually scientists from everywhere, uh, came together to work on this, to try to answer this. This is our collaboration. Uh, the, uh, the blue represents the official countries who contributed money, but the, the green are human beings as well who are working on it. People came from the entire planet, came together to try to understand that. So we are able to do something. We are able to come together. Here's some images of these people while they're working on it. Uh, you can see that they are all different shapes and forms and colors and accents. And they work together. Well, okay, there is this one time when there's the World Cup where they're not quite at peace. But most of the time, we're working together. We're all in agreement. There is a recipe that works. Okay, it does work. You can bring people from every place around the planet. And it's a tiny planet, not a big enough planet to build walls. It's a planet that needs bridges. It needs ways to bring people together. This is what they look like. Uh, these are my best friends, 3,000 of my best friends. Uh, here we all are celebrating um, the, the, the paper of the Higgs boson. Uh, that's not all of them. It's obviously only a small percentage of us. We can't all come together at the same time. Um, so, you know, when you see that, that blue dot there um, and you wonder, you know, why, why should we bother? Why did we go through that entire effort? Um, I think of that blue dot really as a shining light in, a, in our dark universe. We have the capability to do much more than just a little speck. We can do a lot. Thank you.